Hello everyone, thanks for joining me today. My name is Saravan and Shanmugam. I am the Senior Solutions Architect for AWS Edge Computing. Thank you for joining me today on this presentation. On behalf of the EC2 15th year anniversary, I'm pretty excited to be here presenting to you about building ultra low latency applications for, for the Edge, especially for the AWS Edge. So let's get started. Uh, so let's get started. What are we going to talk about today, right? Uh, before we get started into how do I architect an ultra-low applications for AWS Edge, I really want to talk about, give you an overview, an understanding about AWS cloud infrastructure, right? And so that we can go deeper into how to use that global infrastructure so that we can architect an application for low latency. And then we'll dig into services at the various global infrastructure. What are the services available at different points of AWS infrastructure? Then we a little bit of packet routing to really understand how packet routes from your client to the server, meaning from your end user to the applications which is running in the AWS infrastructure. And also we'll get into, right after that, we'll get into what are wavelength zones and local zones, right? Today I'm going to very focused around you know, there are several other edge infrastructures on top of Wavelength and local zones, but we're going to focus more around what is Wavelength zone, what is local zones, why are we building it, where actually is these zones are available for the customers to leverage, and then finally we'll talk about a couple of applications that our customers are building, right? Not just a couple of applications, but several other applications. But I, in the interest of time, I'll just focus on two different applications and say how that architecture looks like and how you can use the edge infrastructure for deploying these applications at the edges, right? So let's, uh, let's get started. Okay, so let's quickly, as I said, let's quickly look into the different AWS infrastructure, right? So if you look at it, we always start at regions, availability zones, and edge locations. So what, is, what are regions and availability zones and edge locations? As I said, this is not going to be a deep dive uh, discussion about AWS infrastructure as such, but we're going to paint the picture. You, we're going to start talking about a story where you understand the different aspect of the infrastructure, and then you see and pick and choose the right infrastructure for deploying your applications, especially if your application needs ultra low latency to enhance the user experience. So if you look at the slide, we have a region, and then the region connects to a couple of transit centers. You would, have, you, would have, you would have heard about this. So we have something called a transit center where the regions connect to, and then the transit center connects to different peering points. That's where the internet traffic is coming into the region, right? So the transit center is the key ingress point for all the traffic that is coming from different parts of the internet it actually repeats itself even for other regions, right? You have US East 1, you have East 2, EU West 1, EU West 2, any region for that matter has this templatized architecture where you have the regions connect to the transit center and the transit center connects to different internet exchange peering points. That's where the internet traffic is coming from all parts of the network, right? And we have our own, we have our own backbone which connects all our regions together, right? When, when there is an inter-region traffic that is going through, the traffic is going through the backbone. So let's keep that in mind. Not just the region, as we moved into diff supporting different applications, one of the key things we wanted to enable for our customers is how can we reduce the latency of the application traffic which is coming to the region, right? If you, most of the traffic that you serve to your customers, either it's web application traffic or video traffic or you're sending data traffic into S3, they're all coming through that peering, in, peering exchanges into the region. But there are also certain level of traffic, like for example, OTT streaming, or you're doing DNS, DNS routing, right? There's a lot of key things where, which becomes very important for some applications to be served at a very, very low latency at the edge of the network. And that's where we build these edge locations across the globe on top of region so that we run certain services in the edge locations, which makes the application traffic much more faster, to behave much more faster, so that you can enhance the user, user application. So we'll talk about what are those services that runs in the region, what are those services that runs in the edge location, and how do I, even without introducing local zones and wavelength zone, how do I distribute my applications between using edge locations as well as region infrastructure, right? Even these edge locations actually peer locally with the external networks. 
so that when the traffic comes from the client networks, from a service providers networks, it's easier to envision that if the, if the CSP is peering at the edge location and your application is running in the edge location or you're using a managed services which is running in the edge location, for example, Route 53 is a service that is available in edge location, it's easier for you to do DNS, faster DNS queries by using Route 53 which is running in the edge locations, but your, ma but your bigger part of the application is still running in the region. Right, so we'll have some call flows where I will kind of walk you through how the traffic flow happens typically from a carrier's network into the AWS region as well as into the edge locations. Right, so what's inside a region? Right, just wanted to paint a picture on what's inside the region. Region, as you know, comprises of one or like three or more availability zones. Right, we build three because of high availability requirements, and these availability zones are basically data centers, right? Multiple data centers comprises of an availability zone, right? That's massive compute, massive networking fabric all across so that the region has um, ample amount of compute for applications to run on top of it, right? If you look at edge locations, so, so before going to edge locations, what are the features available? Region is where there is massive scale compute available and also all the services that our customer wants, running from pure compute database applications, machine learning applications, IoT applications, you name it, we have all these 200 plus features and services available for customers to build their applications on top of these services, right? You can bring your own, own uh, AMIs, build your own AMIs and build, uh, build your applications on top of EC2s or you can actually run serverless, completely go cloud native and run serverless applications, right? We, we have a slew of applications and services available so that we give the right tools and methodologies for our customers to develop applications, to test applications and also to serve these applications in scale to their end customers. So that's what the region is about. Region is about scale. Region is about all the services that our customer wants. And most of the services and features are developed based on feedback, right? We say, we are proud to say that 95% of our features and services are built by the feedback that we get from our customers. Let's look at the edge location. So what is inside an edge location? Edge location is not as massively scalable or scaled as compared to a region. Why? We don't have to have that amount of scale in the, re in the edge location because we're targeting only certain applications to run in the region, right? Sorry, in the edge locations. Like, for example, DNS, uh, Route 53, right? Which is our service, managed services for doing DNS. We have CloudFront for OTT streaming, for caching. So these are some services that runs in the region, uh, sorry, in the, way, in the edge locations. And these edge locations are spread across different parts of the globe, right? We have 25 plus regions. We are building as many regions as possible uh, as getting closer and closer to the end customer. But there's another level of getting closer to the customer in a smaller scale for running certain applications, which is Route 53 and other applications at the edge location. The reason for doing it in the edge location is we, it is possible for your CSPs, for your ISPs, to spear with us at these edge locations. So any client traffic which needs low latency can go straight into the edge locations, again, based on what applications you're running at the edge locations. And then the other part of your application stack is still running back in the region, right? So let's, again, let's keep that in mind. We'll, we'll take a look at the call flow and possible scenarios. So what services are available today in the, uh, in the edge locations? As I said, Amazon.53, CloudFront, Global Accelerated Service, and Lambda at the edge. These are some of the managed services that is available today in the edge locations. Okay, now let's get into what is local zone. So I understand what region is, I understand what the edge location is meant for. It's running some managed services to accelerate the application. But what is this concept around AWS Cloud Continuum? Andy in 2020 announced this concept around AWS Cloud Continuum. What is that? It's basically bringing not only that smaller managed services to the edge location, it's also bringing in the AWS infrastructure closer to where the customers are. So that's when we introduced this concept of Cloud Continuum. If you look at it, as I said, most of the applications can run in the region, right? Um, whatever the customer wants, either it's enterprises, startups, small businesses, digital native businesses, any applications, any customer who wants applications to be running in the cloud, they can in the region, right? Where most application runs it. But we also starting to see the need for applications which needs ultra low latency and high throughput. 
so that they can they don't have to go all the way to the region to run these applications it's not that the region or it's not that we are actually replacing the region with the edge infrastructures but this is where this talk is more important in the second part of the talk where i'll talk about how we leverage all the infrastructure aws infrastructure either it be region or wavelength zone or local zone or outpost or even the snow devices how do i combine these into a well architected distributed application so as i said we're going into applications now where it needs low latency local data processing uh, data residency there are some aspect of these application those needs that benefit that requirements and that's where we are introducing on premise compute metro center computes and 5g networks right so let's let's let me actually walk through what are those different services that maps to this as i said we also have iot devices and rugged edge using snow devices and iot green grasses i'm not going to focus on that but wanted to paint a picture on what this cloud continuum is starting from region where most applications can run going into different parts of your network either it's inside your on premises inside metro in, closer to a metro center or even inside a 5g network is where we are starting to push our aws infrastructure so customers can benefit can be benefited from that low latency access and finally iot devices as well so mapping that service what are those services into these different requirements aws outpost is a service that we have where aws infrastructure can sit in your own premises for enhancing or running aws applications or your applications on top of aws infrastructures aws local zones and wavelength zone is what i'm going to talk about today getting more deeper and finally about aot green grass and snowball which is not the um, core of this discussion okay so what are these infrastructures at the end of it all the same infrastructure sitting at different parts of the network right that's all about it this is what this is this is where you we bring in that powerful aws constructs of same api single glass of management the same orchestration layer same console you can manage aws outpost as an infrastructure sitting in your network you can actually deploy applications in local zones which is carrier agnostics sitting in a metropolitan city or wavelength zone which is deeply embedded inside a 5g carrier network right we have announced partnership with uh, verizon and kddi and skt and vodafone across the globe and we are adding new partnership uh, where wavelength zone sits inside their own network which serves ultra low latency applications to their end customer but when you talk about local zone it doesn't go deep inside a carrier's network but it sits in metropolitan cities where customers can deploy their applications and get low latency that's the smallest difference between a local zone and a wavelength zone at the end of it all the the idea is to bring aws compute closer to the customer so the customers can choose what infrastructure that they want which serves their end users in a much better way rather than depending on that best effort internet path going all the way back to the region again it's not taking the workload and running it in the uh, running from uh, taking the workload from the region and running it in the wavelength zone or local zone it's all about giving options it's all about using that distributed computing options that aws provides to the customer and then look at your application stack and decide and understand what part of the application stack should run in the region and what should run in the distributed compute right we'll talk about as i said we'll talk about two of the use cases that we mostly talk to customers some of these days and i will go deep into the application architecture how do i decouple them where do i run them what services that i need all those things i will actually uh, capture in the coming slides so let's look at couple of scenarios of how the packet routing happens right the same baseline the same baseline slides i'm going to use it for few more slides so we have a backbone you have edge locations we peer at the edge locations we have regions in e us east 1 and east 2 as an example in the us you we have us i'm sorry uh, us west 1 and west 2 as well in the us but just for an example let's take a scenario for one let's say your carrier or uh, your uh, service provider is big enough so that they have their own backbone and you have a user in miami wants to connect to an application uh, which is running in the in us east 1 right and also if you look at this picture the the csp backbone is so huge they are able to peer with us in directly with our uh, transit peering in us east 1 and also their backbone is big enough so that they can also peer with other edge locations right this is scenario number 1 where any traffic that comes from that user of that csp 
can go can get routed through their own backbone go to the public peering and then can access the applications which is running in the region it's the best possible scenario right where your csp or your isp is peering directly with us in a particular given region and since they also peer with us at the edge locations the traffic which is meant to go to the edge edge applications can still go through the same backbone and peer directly with that edge location so this is the best possible scenario where the application is going to get a pretty good latency parameters for applications which is running in the region and also your dns queries your uh, uh, your cloudfront uh, downloading of static images or video streaming all these assets which is coming from cloudfront can certainly be enhanced because your your csp is peering with us at that edge location so this is key whenever you uh, look at an application start to look at how your application will perform based on your users location based on the csp's connectivity route 53 and cloudfront and other application becomes so critical combining them together in a well architected manner is very very important let's look at scenario number 2 right um, where the same user in miami is connected to a smaller csp for example right a smaller csp i'm not going to name any csp so that uh, let's keep it uh, csp agnostic or isp agnostic so let's say the same user in miami is now going to access a certain application or the same application that you have architected and deployed in uh, in the region now they can because the csp is peering locally with one of our edge locations maybe in miami the applications can go straight into the edge locations because the csp is peering directly but there is another there's another part of your applications which is running in the region but unfortunately the csp is not peering directly with an edge with the with the transit location in that case they might be peering with other third party exchanges before the traffic can hit the the region so in that case the traffic has to go take a circuitous path which you don't control the csp routes it and the csp has their own networking architecture to connect to that application but at the end of it all you do have ip connectivity to edge locations as well as region but your latency parameters is sorely dependent on how the packets are routed from the edge location to the edge location as well as to the region so keep that in mind so why and where local zones so as i said local zones are aws infrastructure a small scale aws infrastructure uh, not as big as the region but getting closer to the metropolitan cities right like Houston, uh, Miami, La Las uh, Los Angeles, Las Vegas. These are all the locations where AWS edge computing infrastructures are available. Either it be local zones or wavelength zone. All I want you to focus on is don't look at the don't look at the differences between wavelength zones and local zones. But the idea is getting AWS infrastructure closer, giving options to our customers, and then the customer can look at their application stack, see what part of the application stack. needs that low latency aspect of uh, their compute then they decide how to leverage local zones or wavelength zones then deploy their applications in a distributed fashion that's the key thing so why do we build local zones as i said there's a lot of applications which needs low latency today right there's a lot of complex applications and that's why local zones is getting closer and closer to bigger metropolitan cities right so we have local zones which are sitting in metro location in one of our co locations or edge locations and that's pretty much it the same the same ec2 compute that customers are used to deploying and accessing in the region is available in the in the local zones right um similar to uh, local zones we have wavelength zones right wavelength zones same compute infrastructure but in this case the only difference is it is sitting inside a carrier network right it doesn't actually sit in a edge location or in a in a metropolitan city it gets much deeper into a csp and that's where the difference between metro um, local zones and wavelength zone lies from an application standpoint from a compute standpoint the same ec2 infrastructure sits there so again taking the packet flow any time a packet starts from a mobile application right a mobile application is being served or you're serving a mobile client the application traffic starts from the mobile phone the first thing it hits is it hits the mobile packet core right there's a mobile packet core it's it's either through hardware or virtualization with 5g you can actually build a 5g mobile packet core using cloud native architectures like pretty pretty stateless very powerful enough but the concept is the packet has to drop into a packet core where all the encapsulation decapsulation encryption decryption packet inspection all those thing happens 
And once that happens, then the packet is routed into the external entity. Either the application is going to a load balancer which is running in the region or it is going to a different cloud or it's going to a different aspect of the internet. The first thing it has to do, it has to get to the packet core and then it gets routed to the region, right? Again, it again depends on how the CSP is appearing with us uh, with the transit location, right? And also say the CSP is appearing with us at the edge location. So the concept here is the packet core is the key routing entity where the tunnels of the 5G packets are terminated or the 4G packets are terminated and then the packet gets routed uh, to the respective destination. So keep that in mind. They don't have to, right? They don't, they have to leave the CSP network, right? They have to leave the CSP network to reach the region as well as to reach the applications which is running in the edge locations. So even if we bring the local zones to the metropolitan cities and you run an application in the local zone, your traffic has to leave the your CSPs or your ISP network to reach the application that is running in the edge location. So you do a DNS query or you do download an object from CloudFront. The, the traffic has to leave your ISP network. The idea for Wavelength is, can we bring compute much closer into the CSP network, the same compute, and now we call them as Wavelength zones. In this case, they are co-located they are co-located within the 5G packet core network. Wherever the 5G packet core is running, we co-locate the wavelength zone so that there's not much of uh, any number of hops. There is pretty much no hops from the packet core into the wavelength zone by, by means of which we are reducing the latency as much as possible and also not running into any bottlenecks outside of the CSP network. It doesn't even traverse the CSP backbone. It just gets right outside of the packet core. That's the difference between wavelength zone and local zone. There's a, there is a need for bringing the, way, the infrastructure inside the CSP network where we can think about a lot of 5G based applications. But if you, if you, if you are a non-wavelength non zone CSP customer, you can absolutely leverage the benefit of edge computing by means of running your applications in the local zone. So that's, that's basically the difference between wavelength zones and local zones. We also, what we do is we have a direct connect technology. We use direct connect technology to connect the wavelength zone back to the parent region. So any traffic that originates that your application has to write into the parent region or in the main region, we actually route the traffic through the direct connect, through, the, through our own backbone, back from the wavelength zone into the region. So keep that in mind as well. As you architect an application, it's all about hub and spoke architecture, right? The hub is the main region and the spokes are the different um, infrastructures, right? Different edge locations and different local zones and different wavelength zones. And you start from there and start to decompose your applications and deploy them in different parts of the network. Okay, so when a customer, when a mobile customer now has to send a traffic, now he has capability, now you have the capability as an enterprise or a developer for you to serve that mobile customer in the Verizon network, in the SKT network, in the KDDI or Odophone network to deploy the application inside wavelength zone. So anytime you have now multitude of options, right? You have region where you can deploy applications which are not latency sensitive. You have uh, managed services like DNS and CloudFront and Lambda at the edge. Uh, all these things can be run in our edge locations. Now you have two more edge computing options available, which is local zones and wavelength zone, where you can pick and choose based on your connectivity type, based on your application, based on your end customers, and based on where, where the carriers are, right? If the carrier is not a, a wavelength zone CSP, then you can start to look at local zone options. So what are the locations available, right? So we have um, five local zones we have already announced and publicly available, and they're all connected back to the, the one parent region. We have in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Miami, Philadelphia, and Boston. Those are the five uh, wavelength, uh, sorry, local zones available today, publicly announced in GA. So right now, customers are deploying applications in these local zones where they see a need for reducing the latency and improving the user experience. As I said, they're all these edge locations where the local zones are. They're all connected back to the uh, to to our own backbone, so that the traffic from the edge locations, if they have to go to the main region, they don't they don't leave our backbone. They actually traverse our own backbone. Uh, how about other locations, uh, local zones, right? So we have two local zones uh, which is connected to US West two region. One is in uh, Las, uh, sorry, uh, Los Angeles, which we announced a long time back, and then Denver we announced very recently as well. So 
as more local zones grows and more compute options comes to your metropolitan cities, start to look at your application architecture and start to decompose it. Already, already uh, customers are starting to look at microservices-based application. Now, the real true distributed way of deploying the application comes to you by means of leveraging different edge computing infrastructures as well as the region. How about the uh, wavelength zone locations, right? Uh, wavelength zones, we started off uh, announcing like August 6, 2020, where we announced GA with Boston and San Francisco. And then we added several more uh, wavelength zones across different footprint of uh, Verizon, uh, starting from Boston, New York City, Washington, Miami, Dallas, Atlanta, uh, Houston, and then um, Chicago. So these are the eight wavelength zones available, which is connected in to the US East one region. And also we have three more I'm sorry, four more available, um, sorry, actually five more available. We have been adding so fast, right? New new, re new wavelength zones are being added. In fact, we announced three uh, wavelength zones a couple of weeks back. So all in all, we have 13 wavelength zones with Verizon in the US where, where um, eight of them is connected to US East 1 and five of them is connected to US West 2, right? So these wavelength zones, as I said, are connected back to the backbone using Direct Connect. So any traffic that originates in the wavelength zone just goes to the region directly. But the key, the key concept here is when there is a mobile customer in Boston, when there is a mobile customer in Houston, when there's a mobile Verizon mobile customer in these part of the locations, you can route the traffic, right? You can deploy your applications in that wavelength zone to benefit your end user application experience. That's the key thing. You don't have to deploy every aspect of your application in the wavelength zone. You have to really decide which part of your application stack makes sense to run in these edge locations, right? Um, when we deploy, when we started off the journey of bringing services to the edge, we only brought the managed services like DNS, CloudFront, etc. Now we are actually bringing in real EC2 compute. We are bringing in a capability for users to run EKS containers, ECS containers at the edge of the location, so that you can bring in your own applications and combine them with the power of the massively scalable region to uh, to really go distributed across different AWS infrastructure. So what are the services available, right? I've been talking about uh, the AWS infrastructure, what are the different regions available, what are the, how, the, how these different infrastructure kind of come together. But when you, when you take uh, local zones and wavelength zone, today we support four important services, which is very, which is the basic foundational compute services that is necessary for building applications. So when we started region, S3 and EC2 was the bare bone core foundational storage and the compute services was available. Now it has grown to 200 plus services and growing pretty rapidly. Why? Because we listened to the customer, we understood their requirements and we worked backwards from them. And 95% of those 200 plus services are built based on customer needs. The same exact way when it comes to local zones and wavelength zone, we are listening to our customer needs and, and looking at what applications they need to run in the edge locations. And we are starting off with this four key foundational building blocks of any application uh, architecture today. One is the EC2 for sure. Any applications can run on x86 compute today. So these applications, so we support EC2, EKS, ECS, and EBS. So you can run compute applications on top of EC2s, or you can run container applications using EKS and ECS, and obviously EBS, which gives you that storage options for keeping your objects, uh, sorry, keeping your files and stuff inside the EBS volumes, right? Let's look at a typical reference architecture. This is what I want to really focus on as the second part of the presentation, right? So we kind of talked about different AWS edge infrastructure, right? Local zones and wavelength zones. Why do I use that? Where are the customers that are using these infrastructures today? And how are they looking at their applications and deciding which part of the application should run in the local zones and run in the wavelength zones? So for that, let me let me actually start off with what is that hub and spoke model means? Now, when I talk to developers, when, when my team goes and talks to customers around edge computing, we make sure that they understand that this the application development is around uh, using hub and spoke model. So the hub is the parent region and the spoke is all these distributed edge infrastructures available, not just local zone and wavelength zone. You can also bring in outpost into your architecture discussions. You can also start to think about can I use snowball devices in a disconnected environment? 
maybe some factories cannot be connected to the internet. They might be connected only maybe at certain point in time. So in that case, I need to have a disconnected edge computer options. That's when snow also comes into the picture, right? But looking at it all, it's basically a hub and spoke. You design and develop and scale and test it in the region. But when you want to scale and when you want to distribute and get closer to your end customer, that's where all these edge computing infrastructure comes into picture. So look at this, right? You have all these lo local zones, for example, available in US East 1. Now you think of it as how do I architect an application and distribute using a hub and spoke model, right? The cloud formation template absolutely works the way it is working with the regions. Now it gives you more uh, location options, availability zone options for you to pick and choose what availability zone you want to deploy either in the region or in the local zone. So keep that in mind as we move into this architecture, right? I, as I said, I have two use cases that I'm going to discuss today as part of this presentation. One is the game streaming architecture, right? I talked to a lot of customers uh, who wants to understand what, what AWS brings to the table as far as edge computing options is concerned, right? In that case, one of the important, one of the important uh, application that I talked to is game streaming. As you know, game streaming as such a key requirement, as such a very intensive requirement around low latency and high throughput, right? Especially if you're going to stream the games in real time, interactive manner with your gamers, from the cloud, right? A lot of the games now is being deployed and developed and uh, uh, deployed and served from the cloud, from the cloud, right? There's always a requirement from the gaming customers, from the studios, as well as the game streaming orchestrating platform that they need ultra low latency from the compute to the console or to the mobile users, right? It could be mobile games, it could be wired games, it could be a game which is running on a console. Anything you, you look at them, the game streaming architecture needs low latency. The flip side of it is, is the entire game streaming architecture needs low latency? Certainly not. Let's actually deep dive into an aspect of game streaming architecture, right? This is not the entire um, set of microservices available in the game streaming architecture. This is a typical architecture of game streaming, right? You have a, at the end of it all, there is a game client which is connecting to the back end and trying to play games, right? Pretty simple. But let's decode it a little bit more. If you think about it, there is a lot of back end services that runs as part of the game streaming platform, which the client is not aware of. Only the back end developers are aware of. But if you look at it, there's business logic, there is authentication services, there's web services, there is game development platform, there are um, dynamic ad insertion, which is also possible, right? So there's a lot of things that happens as part of the game streaming architecture is concerned. But the most important aspect of this architecture is the client which connects to the, the compute, which is streaming that video frames or which is streaming that pixels down to the console. That is the most important aspect of the end user experience. When the client connects, the client connects, he logs in, he gets a lot of catalog information, he goes through the catalog, he browses through the catalog, and he downloads, a, a, he picks a, a game and starts playing. Right? Till that point, latency is important. I'm not saying that latency is not important, right? That is also a part of the user experience, but it is not so critical to get to the sub 20 millisecond or sub 10 millisecond for that interaction to happen. The most important aspect, the 95% of the time, the customers, the clients are interacting and downloading playing games and have real-time interaction with multiplayer games and things like that. That's the piece of that architecture, which is so critical where you have to in decrease the latency as much as possible and improve the throughput, right? Today, without edge computing infrastructure, what gaming customers are doing is they're actually deploying the entire stack in the region. Right, which is fine, which is fine. If you have a good connection, if your CSP is well connected and you're close enough to a region, you might have better latency, right? You might certainly have better latency to go to the region directly and still have a better user experience. But these gamers are all across the globe and we don't have region all across the globe in the sense we can't capture at this point all the users are close to a region, right? If you have, for example, there's the user in Miami who wants to connect to a game and start to play uh, with the gaming backend, the traffic has to go all the way to US East 1, for example, right? 
In this case, as I, as I keep highlighting that, there's one piece of that architecture, the streaming compute pod or the streaming compute pool, which is where the streaming aspect of the technology is coming from or the pixels are coming from. That's that low latency part. And beyond that, you don't have to worry about other part of the architecture, meaning to run in the, in the wavelength zone or in the local zone. So let's see, right? So what, what, do the, what do customers do today, right? Customers typically use all those 200 plus services, right? All those 200 plus services run in the region. Using that 200 plus services, they deploy or they develop all those backend applications, right? The web services, the client metrics, using Kafka and uh, using AWS SDK. So you look at, you know, the most important aspect is when the, cli when the, when the client connect to a web service for authentication, there is a load balancer. Typically, there might be an elastic load balancer, which is basically taking in all the API traffic coming from the client and uh, it's executing it and um, uh, taking response or giving response back. Once that matchmaking happens, once the authentication happens, once the entitlement check happens, once the catalog is downloaded, once the client starts to play the game, that's the most important time when you have to make sure that the latency is really managed and it is ultra low latency, right? So there is web services traffic, there is DNS traffic, and he's downloading static images as part of the as part of the catalog. He's interact, he's playing a game and in doing a lot of interactive controls, and he's also sending client metrics. There's a lot of client metrics that is being sent, captured and sent. So if you look at client traffic, client traffic itself has several different subsections of traffic, right? API and client uh, metrics traffic and DNS, DNS traffic and things like that, and downloading some static ob objects, et cetera, et cetera. The most, the, most asp the most important thing about this slide is you are looking at a very, very distributed architecture, right? You have, you already are distributing your application into different microservices, but where do I run these microservices also becomes more important. And that's where the combination of eight services like DNS and CloudFront serves the DNS traffic and static images. Your client metrics and all the web traffic can be served by all your backend services, which is running in the region. And last but not the least, that 95% of your user interaction happens with that two-way interactive real-time application, that is that video streaming traffic. So if I have to look at the AWS infrastructure that I have today and how do I map them, so the, all these backend services are still going to run in the region, right? You're using that 200 plus services to, de to develop and deploy and expose these applications to your client you're still going to run that important aspect of your streaming application at the edge of the network using local zones or wavelength zones for that matter, right? So if you're a mobile client, you are actually targeting Verizon's mobile client or SKT's mobile client, you can basically say, I will deploy that streaming pod, that compute pod using AWS wavelength zone inside the uh, wavelength zone for, for the mobile customer. But if my customer is AT&T, if my customer is Charter, if my customer is Comcast, where do I deploy these uh, uh, EC2 compute pool for, that st for streaming that pixel or streaming my game? You look at all these local zones options that is available and connect the client to the, lo to the nearest local zone. But beyond that, all your backend, complex backend microservices, game development, for example, game testing, for example, all these things can still happen in the region. Okay, this is the power of that distributed application architecture that containers gives you and leveraging that container and mapping it to the AWS infrastructure distributed architecture is so, so key for our customers. So as, as, I, as I kind of uh, do this, right, even if you are, you, you can run the backend services in US East too. So you can do a DNS query and you can download static objects. You can actually interact with your web services application in the region. And finally, you can also download that streaming information, right? Real-time streaming data and interactive, interactive with multiplayer games can happen with the streaming part of compute, which is running in the wavelength zone or local zones for that matter. And one last one we have to touch upon is inference at the edge, right? Inference at the edge is such a key use case, which powers a lot of different use cases, right? Inference, inference at the edge itself is, a, is so critical for customers to leverage for different for different projects and different verticals. Either it's autonomous driving, either it is um, video encoding or doing a lot of compute, GPU at the edge is important. 
especially for inference, there's a lot of GPU necessary and we have GPU instances available in the wavelength zone as well as in the local zone. But if you look at a typical machine learning project, right, there's a lot of data, you have to do data cleaning and data wrangling, you have to use the ML model tools, you have to do training, you have to actually do a lot of tuning to make sure that the model is ready. All these things are time consuming. We have the necessary tools in the region, SageMaker, right? Amazon SageMaker is such a, an ML tool which actually spans across all the needs for an ML developer. Does the SageMaker has to run in the wavelength zone or local zone? Certainly not, you need scale. You need time, you need the massive compute and massive storage for storing all your data to do training. These are all things which is done offline. You don't have to actually do them inside the wavelength zone or inside the, inside the local zone. But the key thing about any application, any ML application is that inferencing, right? You do all these model development, you do algorithms, you bring in your algorithm, you bring in your images, you do create or you use SageMaker or, or our own algorithms, you develop this model. At the end of it all, when the model is developed, you have to expose this model as endpoints to the customer. Certain endpoints can still run back in the region, but some of the endpoints has to run closer to the edge of the location so that any uh, model API query or model API inference query that comes can be, can be run as fast as possible and, and response goes back to the client. So if you, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at all these different flows and different aspect of ML model development, there's a lot of things happens. The most important aspect from a latency standpoint is that inference endpoints, where that inference endpoint is available, okay? Um, so as I map the different services, again, going back to hub and spoke model. So can you help me understand what are the different services that I need to worry about when I deploy an ML project, or when I start an ML project and I deploy, uh, use the AWS tools for creating my model? This is exactly it. There's a lot of SageMaker tools, S3 is available, uh, time stream there lots of I, I'm not going to touch upon all these services, but you can look at the slides There's a lot of different services available to solve your problem when it comes to ML projects But the key thing is where to run when to run how to run and how do I expose my endpoints? When my model is ready and also continuously monitor that model So you can actually pick a G4 instance or another compute option run your model now run your inference at the edge of the uh, edge of the network, but all other aspects of your uh, ML model can run back in the region. Okay, so as I said, back back again, all those all those different aspects of your ML model can back, run back in the region. Whenever there is an inference query um, which needs ultra low latency, that's when the service that's when the packet flow to the edge location compared to the where compared to the region makes makes very very important so either it's smart factory use case retail use cases security and surveillance use case autonomous guided vehicles all these use cases needs inference as fast inference as possible all these back end services are building different models and they want to expose these models as endpoints to these different applications, like autonomous robo, for example. These robots are sending a lot of video streaming information in real time, and they want inference back to them, sent back to them as quickly as possible. And that's where the inference endpoint is key. And that's where running that inference in local zones or wavelength zone, or even in a, in a private mech opportunity, you can run the inference in an outpost rack sitting inside your factory floor. That is also possible. Or in a disconnected environment, you can run the same inference that you built using SageMaker using Snowball Edge at, at the edge of your network, right? So these are the options that you have by means of leveraging, combining the power of scalable services in the region and deploying them wherever you wanted it based on your application requirement. So you might be in an ISP network, you might be in a carrier network, it all depends on how you're connected, but the option is available for you to deploy these inference endpoints and connect to them whenever needed. So just to conclude, as I said, it's very, very important to pick the right tools for the right job. Andy always says that, we want to give you the options. We want to give options to our customers and then work backwards from the customer requirements, help them pick uh, pick the right task or pick the right tool for the right job. So it's very, very important. Deep dive into your application architecture. Our applications are becoming more and more complex and distributed. Not only distributing them using smaller microservices and running them using EKS or other container tools, 
but it's also important to place them at different infrastructures, right? Close enough to the end customer, if that microservice needs to be, use local zones, wavelength zone, and other edge computing opportunity uh, options. If these microservices are complex enough, they are not latency sensitive, they, can, they have to be massively scalable, and they are stateful or stateless, but depends on the latency requirement, you can place them most of the time back in the region, right? And last but not all, as I said, pick the right AWS infrastructure to deploy and pick the right task and deploy them in the right infrastructure. These are key. We are always happy to help you. You have a task where you want our help. Please reach out to us where we can talk about the different services in depth. Go deep into analyzing your applications along with your developers and kind of give you the best recommendation um, with respect to our well-architected architecture for um, edge computing. So with that, thank you so much for joining me. If you have any questions, you can certainly ask me. Uh, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, I'm so excited uh, that I was given an opportunity to present about our edge computing, up, uh, edge computing architectures and take a couple of sample uh, use cases. And I talked over it. There are many, many more uh, use cases, right, where we have to kind of decouple them and find the right infrastructure for that right uh, applications. Thanks again. Have a great day. Thank you for joining me today.